Uh, we've got uh, some time for um, questions and comments, and perhaps I could exercise my uh, usual host's prerogative and ask the um, first question, which I'm afraid says a very, very mundane uh, question about funding, because you mentioned that it is, it is very resource intensive to look after um, uh, autistic children in the way that your son was looked after, and you mentioned in passing it was done by local authorities, but with budgets under such stress, especially local authority budgets, how do you see the future playing out in the sort of current very, very uncertain Well, climate? let's get somebody from Prior's Court School to answer this. Anna, where, where are you? Can you wait for a microphone to uh, come? Oh, we have a chairman, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> The first thing to say um, is that um, obviously one of the pressures is that uh, increasingly local authorities are trying to cut their budgets and as a result more and more the young people who come to the school um, have probably already been tried through several different um, types of care before they actually get to the point where they come to somewhere like Prior's Court. So typically nowadays, um, you know, a local authority will insist that a child is first of all tri tried in a state's ordinary state school. Then if that doesn't work, then they'll perhaps put them into a local special needs daycare school. And something like total residential provision, which is what you can ultimately achieve in Prior's Court, is something that happens as a last resort in many cases. And the sad thing about that, actually, is that really, the, the sooner young people come to somewhere like Prior's Court, um, the sooner we can start to employ all the special techniques and approaches that we take. And ultimately, hopefully, the better impact we can have on that child's well-being. Having said all that, um, yes, of course, we're, we're, we're always being squeezed on budgets. We're always under pressure from local authorities to keep our, um, our costs down to the minimum. They don't like it when we ask them for an increase in, in term, you know, to cope with cost of living increase and so forth. And it, it's a continual um, tension. But having said all that, um, at the end of the day, local authorities have a duty to provide provision and care for young people and in most cases there comes a point in time where there's an acceptance that the kind of provision at Prior's Court is the best provision for the young person. There is a whole complex process that takes place to reach this and very often it involves parents going to tribunal and all sorts and having perpetual battles but Usually, if, if it's the right place for the child and the, the process has gone through, normally then the local authority kind of accepts that this is the cost of providing that, process, that care. It's more difficult with over-19s because then it goes to a different, um, a, a, di a different sort of budget holder. But having said that, we, our young adult provision is full um, and we're always having people looking for places in our young adult, young adult provision. Um, and again, I think it just shows the fact that there just is such a scarcity of the kind of quality provision that you can get from Prior's Court. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. comments, questions. Right, uh, in the centre there. Wave wildly because I've got a, some very bright light shining at me. I'm afraid it's another Prior's Court question. You, you mentioned that the pupils are grouped in seven by age and not by ability. And I imagine that must have taken some, some thought. And I wondered why that decision was made. I was very much involved with the school at the time when those initial decisions were, were being thrashed out. I think the crux of the matter is, do we respect these children? This is a seven-year-old. We want to treat them like a seven-year-old. This is a nine-year-old who's wanting to do different... This is a teenager who's wanting to do different things. And the fact that they can't speak or have very limited intellectual capability doesn't alter that. So age is almost a form of respect. Um, we talk about 
um, pupils at the school and students at the, the Young Adult Centre, basically young people. And that's what we're about. And um, we try to make the best decisions at any time. Okay, in the, in the gallery. Hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah please, where, okay. Where uh, uh, Professor Golding of Bristol University has just proven that um, smoking, in not only in parents, but of the grandparents of the child, increases autism. How do you feel about these industries producing so much deadly pollution and seem to be getting away with it without any um, approach or recourse to their actions? Well, I can't see you at all, but let me just throw it out into the thing. Um, Ian from the National Autism Project, you're the sort of person who can really give an authoritative answer on this. Where are you? Thank you. You're well, my good friend, yes. <laughs> so I can bring the microphone to... Excuse me, I'm Ian Reagan, I'm the director of the National Autism Project, and Steve has just dumped me with an extremely difficult question to answer, which I cannot. I've not heard of this research. But presumably, Ian, it's one of those things that hasn't been checked, and basically... I don't know. I mean, I, I can't even see the questioner. Where are you? He's upstairs. There you are. Okay, so, you know, this is one report, or it's been replicated. These things come, and they go, and they need to... They need independent verification. That can, there have been so many scare stories about what causes autism, what does not cause autism. Most of them, in the course of time, disappear and are never resuscitated. So... I'm not saying this is true or not true, but I don't know yet. There's somebody else in the gallery up there. Can you wait for a microphone to come around, Martin? Else. Hello. Um, do you think it's time for the Department for Education to set a national autistic strategy rather than leave it up to individual local authorities to determine their own policies? which are often, um, my family has found, to its extreme cost, very cynically cost-driven and based on denial and minimisation of children's needs. They are very cynical, as shown by the attitude of the solicitor's firm Baker Small recently, and I believe that that is not an isolated incident, but is reflective of, of some of the cynical attitudes adopted by local authorities when dealing with these children. Please, please come and work with me. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> yeah. Right, OK. Please, here. Yeah. I think it's um, brilliant, by the way, um, what you've said. But worsening provision for the ma majority now, which is going on in education, means that it's getting even worse for the minority, which uh, deeply, um, deeply upsets me. I mean, the mark of civilization is how we treat those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And I think it's a disgrace um, what, is, uh, what is happening. But I have a particular point. I saw a program on psychopathy, which is also a spectrum. And obviously, the point they were making, they're making some progress there in, in, in terms of <coughs> young people trying to change the brain, which is very plastic. Um, I wondered, obviously, I mean, some of this clearly is, is, is going on. Um, how far do you think that the plasticity of the brain and what we're learning is going to help on this? Um, obviously, you're saying there's no cure, but isn't there amelioration to a large degree possible? I mean, we do know that the brain is able to develop and change much later than we thought, because a generation ago, I think we all believed that by the time you were... I was told, for example, if you're not speaking by 23 uh, years old, you'll never speak. Uh, one of my charities has got somebody um, who has started to speak uh, at that sort of age. The thing that I would comment on about budgets is that the, there is a very high national cost of autism. Autism costs the nation 32 billion a year. And that is a real cost with much of which could be saved by 
investing in autism in, the same, in a positive way in order to bring total costs down. So I have stopped talking about uh, how difficult it was for me and, and uh, these poor children, and we don't want them living under the bridges. of. Uh, uh, basically, this is a cost, and it can be curtailed uh, to the betterment of society. Okay, there's someone in the centre there. Yep. Um, Courtney, could you pass the microphone along? Uh, thank you for the talk. I think it's re really important for decision makers to hear the real experience um, as you have uh, given us today. Um, I've been reading about epigenetics, and I, I, you mentioned that there is a genetic component to, uh, or several genes involved in some forms of autism. And the gentleman, I think, upstairs mentioned smoking, which, of course, can um, affect the methylation of some genes and therefore could, you know, that's a mechanism by which it could bring about the switching on and switching off of some genes. And I, I believe that there has been some, um, you know, some work that's shown that there is a, an association with um, some epigenetic factors. I can't see at all that it's going to help, but it may be an explanation, and I wonder if you're aware of any of that kind of work. Well, some of the words you use are sort of too long for me. <laughs> um, but we've been studying genetics at enormous cost. Billions have been spent into genetic studies and linking this with autism. And <clears throat> what, <clears throat> what one has found is that about 80% of the causation of autism is due to something happening in the genetic area. That's about as best I can describe it with. <clears throat> you say several genes, uh, it's thought that over 400 genes are involved. And again, as I talked, not necessarily to cause autism, but to link with autism susceptibility. So it's very complex, and in a sense, <clears throat> we've all been... I mean, I started working on uh, medical research around about the millennium, so I've been doing it for 17 years, and there have been changes, but we still haven't got to really understanding what autism is, as distinct from what it looks like. Thank you. Um, there's a, there's a well-known correlation between, as you mentioned earlier, people that have maths backgrounds and people that work in science and engineering, and quite a few clusters, especially around the technology industry, both as parents and quite a few people actually in the tech industry. What sort of help are you receiving from them, apart from your friend the robot? There is a, <clears throat> a global drive to employ full-time um, about a million people on the autistic spectrum uh, within the IT industry. It rather depends how you define the IT industry. We're all IT in a sense now. So that in the city of London, for example, one would, um, about 50,000 people we would need employed there. Now, some of them are already there. They... they work well in the tech industry and um, once they're in employed um, they are loyal, they don't change jobs, their health records are good, they become very valuable employees. The um, changes that really impact the world um, are not um, Perhaps in a sense they're not all, they're societal changes. Um, how can we be more inclusive? How can we accept and welcome people who think in a different way and may have different sorts of ideas? And when you do take their involvement of people with autism into managerial or other areas, the payback is enormous. Okay, I've got two more questions that I have to all the end, so there and then there. <coughs> um, thank you. Could you perhaps comment a little on the international 
picture and where we rank and lagging and leading and are there very cultural differences in approach to autism in other countries and is there much that we can learn or are we in fact for all the flaws and all the weaknesses in our position one of the better countries in addressing autism well um, in research generally um, britain has one percent of the world's population and produces ten percent of the quality research so basically we're doing very well including in research we do not have the size of america when i started on this i spent three years on an American board to really be able to piggyback on on what they were doing. Um, The um, nations which have been leaders are the Scandinavian nations, particularly Sweden. Um, I know at one time, when I've told you a lot about Giles, at one time we thought perhaps we should move to Denmark because there were some services there. I've been out to Japan, because I've looked at schools all over the place, Um, and there is something about the Japanese culture and equally the Singaporean, if that's the right word, culture that makes it very attractive and easy and welcoming of people with autism. So culture does very much come come into it. Um, The Nigeria, for example, still views autism as a a witch doctory and so on. So there's enormous variation worldwide. But Britain isn't doing badly. Uh, I think what we need is more um, common databases and so on. This IT itself was going to help. And one last question. Thank you very much for the talk. I was very struck by your use of the word woeful, to, as you look back on Jazz's life, um, I can't think that anyone here this evening would, looking at the film with the children, would associate the word woeful with their lives, even though you'd warned us about biting and mm-hmm. hitting, and in other words, things that were not the rosy picture in the film. Um, I think this is why we all had somewhat damp eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 30, 40 years ago, as I was growing up, uh, we had children referred to as Mongol. Mm. They would never have been in mainstream schools. We now use the word Down syndrome. They are in mainstream schools. But because of the new test developed very recently at Great Ormond Street, um, which replaces amniocentesis, 95% of women will choose termination rather than give birth to a Down syndrome child. The paradox for me being the wonderful change since we rejected them as Mongol, now we're more caring, but not so caring as, as to avoid 95% choice of termination. Were there ever to be a Great Ormond Street diagnostic test for autism, would that lead to 95% opting for termination? I think that follows. We have no other reason, no other figure to suppose that that's how women would accept. In America... Uh, families that have a history of autism and have uh, know the gender of their child but pre-birth, they tend to abort male, male children because of that balance, male-female. So, I mean, I, I hate the idea of abortion, but I s- said publicly to you, if I were carrying a child as vulnerable as Giles, I would abort without a moment's hesitation. On that rather (laughs) profound note, I think... (laughs)